Welcome to our third lesson in this series on the book of Chronicles. It's a privilege to share this time with you in God's word. So let's begin with prayer. Lord Jesus, we call on you because we put all of our hopes in you. You are our king and we adore you. Send your spirit now as we turn our attention to the record of your ancestors, David and Solomon. May Holy Spirit teach us from this portion of scripture as he has taught his people for millennia. And we promise that as you do, we will give you the praise and the glory for it all. Amen. This is the third of five lessons on the interpretation and application of Chronicles. Earlier in this series, we came to understand that the book of Chronicles was written for the leaders of Israelites who had returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. God had blessed these Israelites, but they also faced serious challenges. So Holy Spirit inspired the chronicler to write a history of Israel that spoke to their circumstances. We summarize the chronicler's overarching instruction for his whole book in this way. If Israel, after the exile, will be faithful to God regarding the people of God, the king and temple, and the law, then the Lord will advance his kingdom in Israel. In our last lesson, we explored how the chronicler instructed his original audience in his genealogies of Israel's tribes. In this lesson, we'll see how he expanded his instruction further by providing a new version of the reigns of David and Solomon. This second and largest major division of Chronicles appears in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 35 through 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 31, and we have entitled it, The Ideal United Kingdom. Our lesson on the Ideal United Kingdom will divide into two parts. First, we'll look at the structure and content, original meaning, and Christian application of David's ideal reign. Then we'll turn to the same topics as they relate to Solomon's ideal reign. Let's begin with the structure and content of David's ideal reign. David's reign appears in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 35 through chapter 29, verse 30, and divides into three main sections. The first section in 1 Chronicles 9, 35 through chapter 12, verse 40, deals with how David became king over all Israel in his capital city, Jerusalem. The second section describes how David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem in chapter 13, verse 1, through chapter 16, verse 43. The third section concentrates on David's preparations for the temple in Jerusalem in chapter 17, verse 1, through chapter 29, verse 30. Let's take a closer look at each of these three sections of David's ideal reign. In 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 35 through chapter 12, our author rehearsed how David became king in Jerusalem. This section begins by commenting that David was immediately recognized as king after Saul's death. Then David was anointed as king at Hebron. Next, David conquered Jerusalem and received support from all Israel there. This entire section then closes with lists and brief stories about mighty warriors from the tribes of Israel who supported David while he reigned in Jerusalem. This brings us to the second section of David's reign in Chronicles, how David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem in 1 Chronicles 13, verse 1, through chapter 16, verse 43. This section begins with the well-known story of David's failed attempt to bring the ark to Jerusalem. Following this setback, the chronicler regressed in time to remind his readers of previous events that demonstrated that David would not be cast aside like Saul. God had shown special favor toward David, He had received international recognition from Hiram of Tyre. David's family had grown in Jerusalem. And most importantly, David had been victorious over the Philistines who had defeated Saul. Then the chronicler returned to his main storyline and he described David's success in bringing the ark into Jerusalem. 
He closed this focus on the ark by adding that David gave the Levites instructions on how they were to lead worship before the ark in Jerusalem. Now we come to the third major section of David's reign, his preparations for the temple in Jerusalem in chapter 17, verse 1 through chapter 29, verse 30. This section begins by explaining that David was ready to build the temple himself, but he accepted that his service to God was to prepare for Solomon to build it. David then had a number of victories in battle, but he devoted the plunder of those victories to temple construction. Next, when David repented of taking a census of his fighting men, he discovered where God wanted the temple to be built in Jerusalem. David then commissioned temple construction and appointed Solomon to carry it out. And this entire section ends with a grand assembly of Israel's leaders in which David celebrated that Solomon was to build the temple. He also collected large voluntary donations for the temple from Israel's leaders. And after this assembly, the chronicler added a brief report of David's death. With this basic threefold structure and content of David's reign in mind, let's move to the original meaning of this portion of Chronicles. What instructions did the chronicler give his post-exilic audience in these chapters? The best way to discern the answer to this question is to compare what he wrote with David's reign in the book of Samuel. It is well established that the author of Samuel divided David's reign into three distinct phases. It begins with early blessings for David in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 through chapter 9, verse 13. But David's reign declined because of his sin with Bathsheba. In these later years, David and his kingdom fell largely under the curses of God in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1 through chapter 20, verse 26. Then the author of Samuel added his so-called appendix in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1, through chapter 24, verse 25. This appendix puts together positive elements from various times in David's reign to show the enduring benefits Israel could receive from David's house, despite the curses that had come on David in his later years. The chronicler's storyline of David's reign is very different from what we read in 2 Samuel. He chose to present David's reign as an uninterrupted crescendo from great to greater and then to even greater blessings from God. First, the establishment of David's kingship in Jerusalem. Then, David's transfer of the ark into Jerusalem. And finally, David's remarkable preparations for the temple in Jerusalem. Noticing these large-scale differences raises an important question. How did the chronicler create such a different outlook on David's reign when he relied so heavily on the book of Samuel? In brief, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the chronicler omitted parts of, added elements to, and modified and rearranged portions of the record of Samuel. To illustrate how this happened, let's consider just one major omission and one major addition. You've probably already noticed that the chronicler omitted most of a well-known story about David, perhaps the best-known story in the book of Samuel, David's sin with Bathsheba and the curses that followed. The chronicler omitted most of 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1 through chapter 20, verse 26. The chronicler omitted David's sin with Bathsheba but he and his audience knew all too well that David's sin with Bathsheba had brought terrible troubles to his kingdom. So the chronicler didn't try to deceive his audience. He simply told the other side of the story. God continued to bless David in his later years, even while he suffered under the consequences of his sin with Bathsheba. Along with this grand omission, we should also note that the largest addition that the chronicler made to the record of 2 Samuel was this. He replaced David's later years of curses with 
1 Chronicles chapters 22 through 29. In these chapters, the chronicler elaborated on how David prepared for Solomon to build the temple. David gathered materials and ordered Solomon to be ready to build. He organized the Levites, the priests, the overseers, and the treasurers for their service in the temple. The chronicler also drew attention to military leaders and the leaders of tribes who supported David during this time. Then near the end of his life, David held a grand assembly where he collected donations for the temple and anointed Solomon as king. None of these events appear in Samuel. The chronicler added them to highlight how David's reign ended with his greatest successes in service to God. With these changes to the structure and content of David's reign in mind, we're ready to ask this question. What instructions did the chronicler give to the leaders of post-exilic Israel through his version of David's reign? We can summarize the chronicler's instructions in this way. All the tribes of Israel should long for a son of David who, like David himself, rules in Jerusalem secures victory over their enemies, and oversees the proper worship of God in Jerusalem. As this summary suggests, our author redesigned David's reign to highlight a number of themes that spoke to the challenges facing the original readers of Chronicles. For instance, our author repeatedly mentioned that David received support from all the tribes of Israel. This emphasis revealed the chronicler's ideal for post-exilic Israel. From his point of view, all the tribes of Israel should offer their support to the house of David. A second prominent theme that the chronicler brought to his audience's attention was how critical it was for the house of David to rule over Israel in Jerusalem. As we have just seen, Jerusalem played a crucial role throughout David's ideal reign. The chronicler emphasized that David ruled in Jerusalem to put aside any question about which city was to be the capital of post-exilic Israel. Jerusalem was to be the seat of royal power in Israel after the exile. Another special theme that emerges in Chronicles is that David is presented as a king who secures victory over the enemies of Israel. Our author was so conscious of this facet of David's life that he twice added in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 8 and chapter 28, verse 3, that God kept David from building the temple because he was a man of war. Sadly, Modern Christians often take God's characterization of David as a warrior to be a moral condemnation of David. But this is an imposition of modern concepts onto the book of Chronicles. In the ancient days of the chronicler, kings usually did not build temples for their gods as they fought major wars. Rather, they built their temples as acts of gratitude to their gods after victories and peace had been won. This is why God ordained that Solomon, whose name means man of peace, was to be the one to build the Lord's temple. Rather than being a moral condemnation of David, David's victories were essential for establishing peace and security for the building of the temple. And this necessary step of warfare spoke directly to the chronicler's original audience. They faced threats of war at every turn, and they needed a royal warrior whom God would bless with victories over their enemies. In several places, the chronicler also added to the record of 2 Samuel that David gave oversight to worship in Jerusalem. He not only gathered all the materials needed for temple construction, he also organized the priests, the Levites, and other temple personnel for their duties in the temple. The chronicler stressed this facet of David's ideal reign because he knew that supervising proper worship of God in Jerusalem was one of the most important things that David's royal house was to do in post-exilic times. To move God's kingdom forward, 
the post-exilic community still needed a son of David to make possible worship that was acceptable to the Lord. So we see that the chronicler shaped his record of David's ideal reign with specific purposes in mind. He omitted and added materials so that the story of David would give his original audience the kinds of instructions that they desperately needed. Having summarized the original meaning of David's ideal reign, we're now in a position to offer a few comments on Christian application. The Chronicler's instructions have many specific implications for the daily lives of every Christian. We can find ourselves rebuked and encouraged in countless ways by meditating on what the Chronicler wrote about David's ideal reign. But to set the stage for practical applications, we must orient ourselves toward Christ's threefold fulfillment of God's kingdom in the age of the new covenant. First, we must make all practical daily applications of the Chronicler's instructions from David's reign in terms of what Christ has accomplished in the inauguration of his kingdom. Second, we must apply his instructions to our lives in terms of what Christ is accomplishing throughout the continuation of his kingdom. And third, as we apply David's reign to our lives, we must give attention to what Christ will accomplish at the consummation of his kingdom. We've seen how the chronicler emphasized that all the tribes of Israel were to unite in submission to the son of David after the exile. The New Testament has much to say about how this teaching applies to us. Along these lines, the New Testament requires not only Jews, but also Gentiles to unite in their submission to Christ during the inauguration and continuation of Christ's kingdom. It also guarantees that people from every tribe and nation will be one in honoring Christ as king at the consummation of his kingdom. The chronicler also emphasized that Jerusalem is the place where the king is to rule. According to the New Testament, this principle points us to Christ, who also rules from Jerusalem. Of course, we know that in the inauguration of the kingdom, Jesus' earthly ministry reached its climax in and around Jerusalem. The New Testament also teaches that during the continuation of his kingdom, Christ reigns in heaven, which the Apostle Paul called Jerusalem above. And when Christ returns, he will rule over the new Jerusalem, the centerpiece of the new creation. We've also noted that the chronicler stressed the importance of having a son of David who would be a victorious warrior after the exile. Although many Christians fail to see it, the New Testament underscores that Christ leads us as our victorious warrior king. The New Testament teaches that in his first coming, Christ defeated Satan and began to rescue human beings from the kingdom of Satan. He continues to defeat evil and to call sinners to surrender through the ministry of the church. And Christ will utterly defeat Satan, his minions, and all who follow them. And he will also reward all who have served God with the plunder of victory at the consummation of his kingdom. Finally, we noted that the chronicler stressed how the son of David after the exile must oversee proper worship in Jerusalem. In a similar way, the New Testament points to Jesus as the king who leads his followers in the worship of God as well. As the New Testament teaches, Jesus inaugurated his kingdom through his own sacrifice for sin in Jerusalem and called for all people to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Throughout the continuation of his kingdom, Christ mediates before the Father in Jerusalem above, and the church serves him as the living stones of God's temple on earth. And at the consummation, Jesus will lead us all in the worship of the Father in the new heavens and the new earth. Every theme in the Chronicler's record of David's ideal reign connects with New Testament believers 
by pointing us toward what Christ has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. How do divinely inspired scriptures equip us for every good work? Only as we learn how the New Testament explains the Chronicler's themes in terms of the inauguration, continuation, and the consummation of the kingdom of God in Christ. Now that we've looked at David's reign in the book of Chronicles, we should turn to the second major part of this lesson, the Chronicler's record of Solomon's ideal reign in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 9, verse 31. It's easy for Christians to separate the reigns of David and Solomon from each other because the books of Samuel and Kings treat them separately. But one of the first things we notice about Chronicles is that it moves seamlessly from David to Solomon. Once again, we'll begin with the structure and content of the Chronicler's presentation. As we're about to see, in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 9, verse 31, our author shaped Solomon's reign into a large-scale chiasm. This chiastic structure begins in chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, with episodes that illustrate Solomon's great wisdom and wealth. While in Gebeah, God granted Solomon's request for wisdom, and his wisdom is demonstrated by his acquisition of wealth. This first section is balanced in chapter 9, verses 22 through 28, with more details on Solomon's wisdom and the wealth he acquired later in his reign. The second section of Solomon's reign, in chapter 2, verse 1 through 18, concentrates on Solomon's expansion of the influence of Israel through beneficial international relationships. This section explains how Solomon acquired materials and artisans from Hiram, the king of Phoenicia. Then, chapter 8, verse 17 through chapter 9, verse 21, balances the second section with more about Solomon's international relations. This section includes how Solomon hired Hiram's naval fleet to give him direct access to the riches of trade with the Far East much to the amazement of the likes of the Queen of Sheba. After this, the chronicler introduced Solomon's temple building project in chapter 3, verse 1 through chapter 5, verse 1. Here we find the floor plan, the furnishings, the accessories, and the elaborate decorations of the temple. This section is balanced by more information on Solomon's building projects in chapter 8, verses 1 through 16. This brings us to the two-sided centerpiece of the chronicler's chiastic record of Solomon's reign. First, we find Solomon's dedication of the temple and his prayer in the temple in chapter 5, verse 2 through chapter 7, verse 10. In this dedication ceremony, Solomon brought the ark into the temple and asked God to hear the prayers of his people in and toward the temple in every generation. Adjacent to this, in chapter 7, verses 11 through 22, God responded to Solomon's prayer. There, the Lord assured Solomon that he would listen to prayers in and toward the temple. We should add, by the way, that after this large-scale chiasm, we find the death of Solomon briefly mentioned in chapter 9, verses 29 through 31. This overview of the structure and content of Solomon's reign makes it evident that the chronicler was very intentional about his presentation. And the care he took to write these materials leads us to ask why. Why did he present Solomon's reign in this way? What instructions did the chronicler give to the leaders of post-exilic Israel in these chapters? We can summarize the instruction of Solomon's reign for the original audience of Chronicles in this way. All the tribes of Israel should long for a son of David who will exercise wisdom like Solomon, increase Israel's prosperity and international influence through worship in and toward the temple. As we saw earlier in this lesson, one way to gain insights into how our author hoped to impact the post-exilic community 
is to compare his account with his biblical source, in this case, the book of Kings. The record of Solomon's reign that our author had in his hands appears in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 11, verse 40. This account in the book of Kings divides into three main sections. First, Solomon's struggle for the throne in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 46. These chapters report intense political intrigue that began after David's death. Through a series of clever political moves, Solomon overcame his rival Adonijah and took David's throne. But this was far from a smooth transition of power from David to Solomon. Solomon's struggle for the throne of Israel is followed by a record of his positive accomplishments in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 10, verse 29. The book of Kings reports that Solomon's enormous wisdom led to many benefits for Israel, his extensive government, and his many building projects, including the building of the temple. Yet, Solomon's kingdom did not end well in the book of Kings. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 40, we find the decline of Solomon's kingdom. In the book of Kings, Solomon's kingdom declined because he sought international alliances by taking many foreign wives in violation of Moses' law in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17. Pharaoh's daughter, in particular, led Solomon so far away from the Lord that he placed idols of his wives' gods in Jerusalem. As a result, the Lord sent foreign adversaries against Solomon, and Jeroboam I of the tribe of Ephraim led a revolt against Solomon. Moreover, the prophet Ahijah announced that Solomon's united kingdom would be divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. In contrast with the balance between times of blessings and curses for Solomon in the book of Kings, the chronicler's record of Solomon's reign is, like his record of David's reign, another uninterrupted crescendo of God's grace and Solomon's accomplishments. The first stages of the chronicler's chiastic record of Solomon's reign reveal Solomon's early wisdom and wealth, his early international relations, and his building projects. The centerpiece deals with Solomon's temple. The last stages of Solomon's reign move forward with more building projects, more beneficial international relations, and more wisdom and wealth. In addition to noticing these overarching differences between the portraits of Solomon's reign in Kings and Chronicles, we should also take time to note a significant omission and a significant addition that the chronicler made. Just as the chronicler omitted David's sins with Bathsheba and the troubles that followed, he also omitted Solomon's marriages to foreign wives and the troubles that followed in 1 Kings chapter 11. Of course, the post-exilic audience knew about Solomon's wives and the decline of Solomon's kingdom. He was not trying to deceive anyone by omitting these topics. Rather, the chronicler wanted to highlight how Solomon continued to receive God's enabling benevolence and blessings right up to the end of his life. In addition to this major omission, the chronicler also made a very important addition to Solomon's reign. I have in mind God's response to Solomon's prayer at the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13-16. through 16. Listen to these well-known words of God's response to Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 through 16. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen 
and consecrated this house that my name will be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. The chronicler added these words to what he drew from the book of Kings because they spoke so directly to the situation his post-exilic audience faced. The difficulties that his first readers endured could be reversed if the people would humble themselves, pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways. If they would do these things, then the Lord would forgive and heal their land. But where were the people to offer such prayers? In and toward the temple. In verse 16, the Lord said that he had chosen and consecrated this house, the temple in Jerusalem, and that he had done this forever. His eyes and heart will be there for all time. We can further our understanding of the chronicler's instruction in his record of Solomon's ideal reign by comparing his presentation of Solomon with his portrait of David. We'll look at five ways Solomon exceeded David's accomplishments. First, David often showed wisdom, but Solomon displayed far more wisdom than David. He was the wisest man ever to have lived. Post-exilic Israelites were to long for a son of David who would build God's kingdom with incomparable wisdom. Second, our author emphasized in 1 Chronicles that David waged war, but constant war was not what the chronicler offered to Israel in his day. As Solomon's name, man of peace, indicated, Solomon brought peace to Israel. Peace after victory over God's enemies was won by the house of David. And this was the chronicler's hope for post-exilic Israel. Third, David had wealth in 1 Chronicles, but not in comparison with Solomon's wealth. The chronicler wanted the leaders of post-exilic Israel to believe that the house of David could bring prosperity beyond belief to the kingdom of God. Fourth, David expanded the territories of his kingdom in 1 Chronicles, but Solomon expanded Israel's territories and international influence even further. As Psalm 72 and many other passages indicate, the hope of Israel was that the house of David would one day rule over the entire world, and this is what the chronicler reaffirmed to post-exilic Israel in his record of Solomon's reign. Fifth, David enthusiastically prepared for the construction of the temple in 1 Chronicles. But in 2 Chronicles, Solomon actually built the temple and made it the centerpiece of Israel's kingdom forever. This was the hope the chronicler held out to his audience. As the prophet Ezekiel predicted, the chronicler assured his first readers that through the house of David, the temple would take its rightful place as the centerpiece of the entire world. With this assessment of the original meaning of Solomon's reign in mind, we're ready to turn to Christian application of Solomon's ideal reign. What does the chronicler's presentation of Solomon have to do with us? Once again, there are many practical applications that we can make from these chapters in Chronicles, but we must always be careful to orient our practical applications toward the New Testament's teaching about the three phases of Christ's kingdom. As we have seen, the chronicler called for his original post-exilic audience to long for a king who was wise like Solomon. Wisdom characterized Solomon's reign, and the only way for the kingdom to move forward after the exile was through the leadership of another wise king. From the Christian point of view, Jesus is the only son of David who fulfills this longing. And as the New Testament explains, Christ is the wisdom of God. And his wisdom is revealed in his earthly ministry during the inauguration of the kingdom. He reigns throughout the continuation of his kingdom with unsurpassed wisdom. And his wisdom as the son of God will be displayed in the new creation at the consummation of all things. Solomon, whose name means man of peace, 
brought the cessation of war and the joy of peace to Israel for many years. The post-exilic community was to long for a king who could bring peace as they faced enemies in their day. The New Testament points out that Jesus is the one who brought peace that passes all understanding to God's people some 2,000 years ago. He continues to bring peace to us now day by day, and he will finally bring peace to the entire world in the new creation to come. The chronicler also emphasized that Solomon greatly increased his own wealth and the prosperity of Israel. This theme was designed to guide the post-exilic leaders to long for a king who would do the same in their day. Now we have to be very careful to take the New Testament perspective on prosperity in our day. In the inauguration of his kingdom, Christ richly blessed his people by pouring out the Holy Spirit, the first fruits of our great inheritance in the future. At the same time, however, Christ and his apostles were economically poor. But this in no way dismisses the prosperity they enjoyed through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The same is true during the continuation of the kingdom. No matter what our economic circumstances may be, every follower of Christ is rich with the blessings of God's Spirit. And of course, at the consummation of Christ's kingdom, we will be blessed both spiritually and economically as we reign in glory with Christ in the new creation. The chronicler also focused on Solomon's expanding international influence. In this way, Solomon was a model for any king who took the throne of David in the post-exilic period. Israel was destined to expand beyond the borders of the Promised Land, and this was the hope of those who had returned from exile. Along these lines, the New Testament reveals that in his earthly ministry, Jesus called his disciples to expand the influence of God's kingdom throughout the world. During the continuation of the kingdom, Christ empowers and guides the church as it proclaims the gospel to every nation. And as we all know, at the consummation, there will not be one person, not one place in the new creation that is beyond the borders of the kingdom of God. The centerpiece of Solomon's great kingdom was the worship of God at the temple in Jerusalem. And the post-exilic audience was to hope for the renewal of temple worship through the house of David. The New Testament explains that Christ fulfills this hope in the inauguration of his kingdom as Christ's great high priest, the embodiment of the temple. He continues as our mediator in the temple of heaven during the continuation of his kingdom, and he fills the church on earth with his spirit. And when Christ returns at the consummation of our age, the entire new creation will be God's temple, filled with the glory of God. In this lesson, we've reflected on how the chronicler presented the ideal United Kingdom in the reigns of David and Solomon to the leaders of post-exilic Israel. We've explored the structure and content, the original meaning, and the Christian application of the Chronicler's presentations of the reigns of David and Solomon. Everything the book of Chronicles tells us about David and Solomon guides us as we serve Christ. He is the perfectly righteous royal son of David's house. We know the one for whom the Chronicler hoped in his day, and we serve this immeasurably glorious king, Jesus of Nazareth.